through guidance, so, okay. uh, remote support, missions, and taking on issues with other clusters as well as OCHA at the global level if required. So I repeat, we can do guidance, remote support, uh, missions, and taking on issues with other clusters as well as OCHA at the global level if this is required. In order to use all our brain here and to ensure coherence, we have agreed that all support we give in this process is done collectively by the protection cluster, including all the AORs. So you will find in some operations that child protection AOR, global IMO is on mission, but to support the protection cluster and other AORs and vice versa in other operations. Now, on the substance of the matter regarding the HNO, I have four uh, key messages to you before I hand over to, to Dream. First, we're surprised to see the OCHA guidance uh, sent 10 days ago or two weeks ago. Uh, however, we are supportive of the overall OCHA direction, but this guidance went out without consultations with us and we had to react to it. So we've taken two tracks. Uh, first, we have uh, worked with OCHA and other clusters to rectify the note that they have sent. And I would like to announce that we are in the process of revising it and it will be resent. That was our first track. The second track is we didn't want to leave the confusion lingering until OCHA note is resent. So we have developed our own note that we sent to you last week. We guarantee that the OCHA note will be, that will be resent next week, will be in line with the note that we have sent uh, previous week and we're presenting today. So for the protection cluster, the note that we have sent uh, last week is final for this year. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's important to, uh, to note. My second message is that, of course, we are overall supportive of OCHA direction to have a strong intercluster analysis in the HNO. We actually see this as beneficial for the, from a protection perspective because it can allow to have protection more at the center of the analysis through four parts of the HNO. One, through the summary of the humanitarian needs chapter, through the crisis impact and a human solid uh, protection chapter. So let me be very clear. We must have a protection chapter that is well done. We also need, as a cluster, including AORs, to be active and driving force in the protection elements of the intersectoral part. That is uh, uh, important. Third, we would like the centrality of protection to be featured, among others, through the protection PIM. So we encourage you and support you to ensure that the protection PIM is featured on the first page of the HNO next to the people in, in need of mental and physical well-being, as well as living standards. So we really would like the protection pin to be among the top uh, uh, descriptives of how we are portraying uh, a crisis. It is very important that the protection pin is the same in our sectoral chapter and the intersectoral analysis. No, I mean, and it should be calculated by the protection cluster, including the AORs, in collaboration with the interagency space. But what we do not want is to have a protection pin in our chapter that is different than a protection pin in the intersectoral chapter. They have to be one and the same. So it's very important that our protection pin can actually be disaggregated by physical mental well-being. So if we have million people in need of protection, we need to know how many of those are in physical and mental well-being need, as well as living standards need and others. Also, where the capacity is, 
the protection pain should be disaggregated by AOR. And that would be helpful in terms of advocacy and in terms of planning uh, through the HRP. Finally, it is important to reiterate that the work you are doing on severity and PIM done together cluster. So work the indicators sit together, but also bring on other clusters where it matters. It shouldn't just be us. It should be also including other clusters and the interagency sphere where, uh, where it matters. Uh, at the global level, we're really working together as, a, as one team, as you would see from the missions and from the guidance and from this webinar. And we really are keen to support you to do the same in all field operations. And with this, I, I close uh, the first part of the webinar and see some questions starting uh, to come in, put in more questions. And I hand over to Dream, who will take us through a step-by-step -step process of the guidance for, for 10 minutes. Over to you, Dream. Uh, it's not here, it can just... It can, the voice will, don't, don't worry. Yeah, they can you sure? And meanwhile, can I please ask everyone to keep themselves uh, on mute and if possible also to disable the video function, please. Do you want me to share the, your presentation? Yes, please. Sure. Hi everyone, this is Dream. I'm the Information Management Officer for the GBV AOR. And if you have trouble hearing us, please just leave a message in the chat room. And also we encourage to you register your questions while we go along. Okay, and just a few seconds, we're gonna pull up the presentation we'll be using to explain the step-by-step -step guide that's being sharing, we've been shared with the field. Can anyone see? Uh, can everyone see the the presentation? No, not yet. Oh. All right. Just give me one more second, please. Um. It's working. All right. Okay. Great. To the presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, again, everyone, for joining us in this webinar. So, in the next 10 minutes, to take all of us through the step by step on how we propose uh, to estimate the protection people in need, as well as AOR people in need in the framework of a severity analysis. And I'd like to open the session by giving an overview of the data environment. So I'd like to say there is no single guidance that can be pasted into all operations. We're all different in our nature, our magnitude of the problem, and as well as in data environment. Some of you can have quite rich data environment. You have a lot of assessment and the census data available. Some of you could have none. So bearing in mind that everything will be introduced here will still need to be tailored and textualized in your own context. So what do we mean by data poor and data rich environment? I'd like to give us a few examples. In a lot of the operations you might encounter the following assessment or data or reports. You might have a multi-sectoral needs assessment also level being carried out in the national in the national level. You might have a displacement tracking matrix carried out in a camp level. You might have monitoring that's carried out by our, ourselves and our partners. You might have full security cluster as well as WP VAM on consolidated food security assessment. You might also 
national surveys such as DHS, MISC, and in a pre-crisis on an ongoing crisis setting, you might have other data sources that are available, including our own response and service mapping data. And in many countries, you might have none of them, or you might have them. This is what we mean by data rich or data poor environment. So as a start, all of us should already know, or at least needs to share what assessment, what information, what survey, and what data are available in your context. And following by brief introduction, potential environment for a severity analysis would be enabled in a data-rich environment, and vice versa would not be quite possible in a data-poor environment. And we'd like to talk a little bit in both of these environments, what would be our people in need consideration? So, first of all, we always, always consider an overarching and contextual indicators for people in need in both of these environments, all of the operations. What are they? Including these, for example, starting with an overall displaced population. That, in, that could include your IDPs, refugees, returnees. And your overarching protection concerns are in intersectoral indicators such as security incidents, uh, issues related to legal frameworks, safety issues, or humanitarian access problems. You can live in besieged area or hard to reach areas. You could also look at other overarching social, economic, and demographic indicators such as people that are living under poverty line, female or children headed households elderly, people with disabilities. You could also look at other clusters in the that would affect a protection consequences, such as a food security, um, people who are living food insecure status. And you could also look at your existing analysis of current response and service activity and gaps uh, per location, such as Number of children, the percent of children with access to the PSS programs, mine contaminated areas, presence of civil registration, and also you could look at the contingency plans based on the anticipated actions. For example, in for example, the liberation of besieged areas, and as well as foreseen influx, for example. So this is what we talk about. This is what we meant by contextual and overarching indicators, and this is what you can you can look into in both of these environments. So for the data poor countries, this is probably all you would have. And moving to a more data rich environment, and we have the step by step guide, which I'm going to go through right now, that would enable you. To, to, to carry out this exercise. So for data rich environment with all the assessment available in your operation, first we start by looking at a collectively together a selection of indicators. And we're asking all of us as a protection cluster and AOR together to look at these four types of indicators. Contextual overarching protection indicator, which already mentioned, which is going to be followed by a more detailed case studies and presentation from Somalia. And we, we will look at indicators specific to each AORs, specific to other areas of protection, and other classes indicators that affect protection. After the selection, what we will do is build a reference table that enable us to, to structure the threshold for each indicator according to a different level of severity. So an example would be this. For example, if from scale one to five, what would we consider the minimum problem to a moderate problem to a severe problem? So we, we are able to structure the indicator on a scale by building different thresholds. Do we have any reference for those indicators? Yes, so there is a sheet that attached to the guidance that's being sent to you are all the example indicators that we developed. But again, these all need to be 
contextualize and adjust it operation. So next step, after selection, after selecting the indicators, we will need to classify a, and identify which humanitarian consequences it belongs to, and also if it's AOR specific. By doing that, very simply, just use the same indicator and identify and classify which of the humanitarian consequences it belongs to. So either living standard, physical and mental well-being, or if it's AOR specific. After completing that, next would be process the data and we try to use existing data to produce results based on the scale and the reference table that we developed. And you're more you're likely to be use an Excel-based consolidation sheet or tool. You'll be inputting a severity per location, per indicator, according to your threshold. And if your data is not available in some of the locations, we suggest use consultation, use expert judgment and knowledge to fill the gap. And it's critical for us to vet the results in the end, according to the ground truth. Your consolidation sheet will likely, most likely look like something like this. So based on per indicator, a severity score will be assigned in each location, each indicator. And then we'll present those indicators after testing with real data at intersectoral level for validation. Sometimes this step could come a bit earlier. Afterwards, we calculate the severity score per location, which would, from the previous steps, enable us to aggregate a score in each of the location. And last step, we will using the each of the severity score that we generated for each location for translating to the people in need number. So know that in this step, it will be a case by case uh, identified in your country level of, of how to convert those scales to to the people in need. And an example of that could be um, any of the as many of the OCHA and intersectoral guidance suggest, uh, uh, your, your scale of three and four and five would be considered people in need. But again, on a case by case level, it's still need to be consulted and endorsed and validated by the country intersectoral forum and also HCT. Can you please mute yourself? That will be it. And I'll be looking forward to answer some of the more detailed questions in a later session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dream. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. I would like to ask Christophe, can you hear me? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Christophe here, the coordinator of the Protection Cluster for Somalia. I'm sitting together with Chris, which um, uh, who many of you in Geneva know. Uh, it's been deployed. Uh, uh, in the context of this support that the global cluster is um, uh, uh, giving to, uh, to the cluster. So it comes from the child protection era, but uh, is very much helping uh, the, the whole of the cluster. And, and thank you, colleagues in Geneva, for the support, and thank you, Boris, uh, very much for, for, for the support. It makes a big difference. Now, I sent uh, um, a presentation, uh, um, which is actually the, the PowerPoint, the few slides which I, I used yesterday, we had a, a meeting and uh, a schedule, so of course I, I, we had to devote time on, on, uh, on this discussion and trying to have a consensus on a few steps. Uh, if I refer to the presentation that we had from uh, uh, colleague Paul, uh, we, I would say we have um, completed step one of the, of the process, process, so there is still quite a bit of work to do. And uh, I was not able to uh, yesterday uh, to get a message on, on this, on all the details that uh, are required in the, in this process. Do the slides show uh, in particular the indicators that we have uh, listed uh, for the uh, overall severity scoring, the overall protection severity uh, scoring of the, of the areas, the districts uh, in in Somalia. 
um, starting with a set of indicators uh, to um, capture the, the magnitude of the crisis in terms of, uh, of population and, and displacement. Uh, I don't see if, if colleagues can see that, but there is, of course, the number of, of people displaced, uh, the percentage of people displaced compared to the uh, total population in the district. Uh, we we also after the discussion we also had uh, a suggestion to um, capture in particular the, the number of people displaced by by conflict uh, uh, just to capture a particular uh, sensitive aspect of the of the protection environment here the armed conflict and, and the armed violence. Um, can we see the we cannot see the presentation? Yes, I cannot see the presentation either. Neither is it uh, something that in Geneva they can display? We will display it just uh, in, in a second, but you can go ahead. Right. Well, I'm really describing uh, uh, my presentation, what we have done. Uh, you can look at the details uh, afterwards. Uh, then we had indicators on... Um, no, I need to see my, my presentation. Uh, uh, on, um, yes, I'm making a link with the uh, the severity uh, of uh, of other essential uh, um, uh, non-protection sectors to to many regards, and we decided to have a severity scale based on the number of and the severity degree, the severity scoring provided by other uh, life-saving uh, um, clusters. Uh, wash, uh, nutrition, food, and, and health. So if these four uh, clusters uh, score uh, the high, the, the severity in a district, this will also be uh, taken into account in our own uh, in our own severity uh, scoring. And to complement that, we decided to also include uh, two indicators documented by the MRM, the number of, number of attacks on health facilities and the number of attacks on, on schools. Uh, the, uh, then there is a, a, a third uh, a group of indicators uh, measuring various things. Of course, we'll have to refer to access, uh, and this we're going to, to rely on, on the, the scoring that OCHA will be uh, providing. But we keep the right... Yes, thank you. I'm uh, on slide uh, four already uh, um, in my presentation. So that's the last group of indicators. I'm talking of for the overall protection, uh, and, and there, is, there is many more indicators that the AORs are, are currently, currently uh, using for their own scoring. So uh, I was mentioning the humanitarian access uh, uh, scoring, uh, which will be provided by OCHA, but we, which we will look critically. The, the access can be different uh, for uh, food security colleagues uh, and, and for us. Um, so we'll we'll take the scoring as a starting point, but we may adapt it to our own circumstances and all capacities. Conflict intensity areas are very important thing as well to uh, to capture. As I said, we are going to use the the number of displaced uh, uh, posed by uh, by conflict, but we're also going to look at. Uh, Two other sources uh, which may help us to score there. Uh, INSO, uh, the, the NGO uh, um, monitoring access for NGOs, we're going to approach them to get uh, to get their data. And another source we want to explore is uh, ACLED, uh, which many of you know. Apparently, they, they monitor uh, conflict, uh, armed conflict in in countries. And I understand based on public sources. So we want to uh, to see what it, uh, it produces for us and, and make a scoring accordingly. Uh, the third indicator listed here is about presence of um, of uh, explosive hazards, as we say in, in, here in Somalia. So yuxos and explosive remnants of war. And we had discussion this morning. Uh, uh, Boris had a discussion discussion this morning with the UMAS colleagues to fine tune this. Um, then child recruitment. Uh, and uh, last is about eviction, which, which is quite a critical protection uh, a problem here, uh, mostly, uh, mostly in urban areas. We will probably have a, a scoring based both on evictions, which we have, we have recorded probably in the last 12 months, and, and the risk of evictions, a number of uh, mapping uh, of, of risk evictions, of eviction risks, pardon, has been, have been conducted in, in the country. So uh, the, the eviction risk will also be part of this uh, of this indicator. Uh, this is uh, this is the first step. Pardon. The next slide is um, the last slide is was to explain to the to the members 
uh, how this scoring will be used afterwards and combine with uh, um, uh, results coming from the, the, the MCNA. Uh, REACH, the NGO REACH, has conducted an intercluster uh, household survey across the country with, with interesting results, uh, which has its limitations, but um, we want to see uh, what it says. Uh, and we have asked uh, REACH to uh, calculate for us uh, um, uh, percentages of uh, vulnerable people uh, by district, uh, by level of severity, and both for hosts and IDPs. So for that, we have produced, I haven't, uh, it's not on the slide, it's a sophisticated uh, uh, matrix, finding all the, all the possible indicators that GMCNA can, can document with a scoring uh, uh, scale, uh, and which determines the, the level of vulnerability of, of households. And we want to see what this is going to produce and, and tell us. And comparing and uh, with the with knowledge in the room, we're going to have a, 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 a meeting with the AORs uh, next week, uh, taking these percentages and the knowledge in the room and what the AORs as well have been able to, uh, to determine and measure. And we come together on the, very, the percentages, the final percentages we're going to apply to determine the people in need in each district, district and for each of the severity uh, uh, levels. Um, so this is a, a, a process which is going to be, uh, which has to be rushed a bit, I must say. We understand the constraints. We have to, uh, with OCHA, give the pin uh, uh, on the 5th of September. Uh, so we, the discussion we're having, uh, in particular next week, will take place uh, between uh, the coordinators of the AOR, basically, here, plus the government. Uh, the government in Somalia is very interested to, to follow that, and, and um, so we're going to have them in the room as well. And I, I told the members of the cluster, I, I'm going to share with you the, the results. And I, we, we will probably, we will surely uh, disseminate the results of all of this to the state level coordination for a review at the field level, if I may say. That's it in a nutshell on where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe. Uh, uh, and thank you uh, for, uh, for taking the time for sharing uh, your, uh, your experience. Uh, now I would like to open the floor for uh, interventions, uh, questions, uh, and comments from everyone. So, uh, if you have uh, questions, I see some questions uh, coming in. Please either uh, type them in or put down your name so we call you uh, to, uh, to, uh, to basically uh, ask your question. So, the question, the first question from uh, Darin. Uh, question regarding data rich versus data poor environment. I understand that the indicators of data availability, uh, but how would you advise us to determine if each context is data rich or data poor? How many of the indicators need to be met for us to consider the data poor or data rich? So that's uh, the first uh, question. Uh, the second question is, uh, I follow the protection severity scale guideline, which makes perfect sense, however, I can't find the difference between the intersection severity scale and protection severity scale as the process and guideline will be basically the same. What would the, be the key main change and impact of this approach in developing protection severity scale, which will be built on intersectoral humanitarian impact? I see. Uh, so thank you, uh, Darin. I would like to uh, uh, to answer uh, both questions. So first, I don't think uh, the point of saying a, uh, a country is data rich or data poor is important at this stage. I think what we're trying to convey here is that some countries have solid indicators with good sources of data that need to go through a process and some countries just do not have uh, uh, these kind of uh, data. Nevertheless, the countries that do not have uh, uh, enough uh, data that can back up indicators need to come up with some kind of uh, expert judgment indicators uh, and process to uh, define uh, the locations that are severe uh, 
in, in overall protection issues or specific protection issues that are related to AORs or specific to, the, to a context like evictions in the Somalia context. So I don't think you need to classify yourself as data rich or data poor, but to understand that our guidance uh, is quasi impossible to have one guidance for all operations because the data re reality is so different. So the more your data rich, the more you can follow the, the guidance, the more data poor, the more you will need to interact with our uh, uh, the people in, uh, at the global level or your peers locally to find out uh, alternative methods to, uh, to deal with the situation. Now, for the difference between the intersectoral PIN and the protection PIN, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think the, uh, the indicators that we agree on in the protection sector uh, for our governments could be more than those who are adopted at the intersectoral level uh, to describe protection. So what will happen is that at the intersectoral level, we will have people with acute needs, which are people with physical and mental well-being, and then we will have people with uh, living standards need uh, needs with the indicators uh, there, and we'll have people with with protection needs. Part of the people with protection needs will be those who have physical and mental well-being. Another part will be a small a slice of those who have living standards needs. And we have additional protection needs that are related to risk or security or other protection issues uh, there. So uh, I think that there might be the case that the protection pin will be equal to the intersectoral pin. But I don't think uh, uh, that will be the case everywhere. If it happens to be so, uh, no problem, but that should be reflected in, uh, in the narrative. I hope this answers the questions. Please follow up in the chat room if I didn't. Now I have a question from Kristen Arthur. Question. How do you recommend we incorporate different data sources that are not countrywide? For example, in Ethiopia, we have small pockets of data sets, but few are standard uh, countrywide. So how do we deal uh, with such situation? Uh, I think one important principle is don't ignore good data, even if it is not covering countrywide. <laughs> These data are so precious, you know that. It takes a lot of effort to collect them and do them. I think the uh, the, the possible uh, uh, solution for this, and we will have to discuss on case by case basis, is that to complement the other geographic areas by expert judgment, and uh, use uh, more rigorous data for the geographic area where we have. Now, it's very important that in the narrative we acknowledge the uh, uh, the difference of the quality of data for geographic location. Be totally transparent uh, and open uh, that in some geographic locations we have solid evidence, hence we can do solid programming. In others, we have uh, uh, estimations or expert judgment and might require as part of the programming to do more solid needs assessment or uh, or understanding in order to do the HRP or uh, or the programs. Uh, it's a guy. So I have a question from Ambika uh, Mukun. Thank you, Ambika. Good to hear from you again. Uh, is the guidance posted anywhere? It was sent in the email and. If you haven't received it, I will make sure after after this webinar to for you to get a copy. Uh, Ambika, as as solid as ever. So uh, the uh, the guidance is an email just after the meeting. Uh, our colleagues from uh, from the IM groups will share it on the Skype groups that uh, exist, and we will post it on our website uh, as well and and share the link. Thank you for uh, for raising this issue. Do we have more questions? Or anyone wants to speak?
Christine, uh, I have a new question from Christine. Is there a funding priority associated with the consequences? Yes. Uh, Christine, can you take the mic and explain yes, your yes. question? Yes, so, so yes, just enjoy and... Sorry, uh, Christine, I would like you to take the mic and explain a bit your question. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, so um, we attended a briefing at OCHA, I believe it was yesterday or the day before, and they, they introduced these four consequences. And my impression, and I'm asking in case, I'm asking for clarification to ensure I understood this correctly, that the way they explained it was that the first consequence would be prioritized for funding, followed by the second consequence, and then followed by the third consequence and so on. So I'm just checking with you as the global protection cluster, if that's also your understanding. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, Thank you so much for asking uh, this question. The answer is categorical, absolutely not. It is very important that we push back on this point, and this is a very strategic point. I would like to follow up uh, with your OCHA colleagues also in the field to link them up with OCHA colleagues at the global level to clarify this. The consequences are of physical and mental well being of uh, uh, living standards, as well as uh, resilience and uh, protection. The, these four consequences are equal in importance. It's, in, it's extremely important to clarify that, including in the narrative of the HNO itself. And this is something I'm personally willing to weigh in for where, where, this, where the guidance in the field is not consistent with that. We cannot accept as a protection cluster that uh, risks related to, uh, uh, to for example, uh, living standards, that if we do not intervene right away for could become uh, life-saving for us, this is, this, this is of high priority, of immediate importance, and of equal importance to those who have physical and mental well-being issues right now, uh, as well as many of protection issues that are not related to physical mental well-being and living standards and related to risk, such as mine action or uh, gender-based violence uh, issues, they need to be treated as a priority one, not as a fourth category thing. So, uh, thanks for the question. This is extremely important. We'll clarify it in the recent uh, uh, note by OCHA, I asked my colleagues Dream and Musa to take note of that and flag it to OCHA immediately. We don't want a narrative that says that priority one will get more funding than others because it's more important. The consequences are to structure our narrative and understanding of the situation and not to prioritize uh, where funding should go. Have more than one question. Okay, can you highlight to me one by one? So starting with, I think you answered no. No, so no, I didn't. So I think starting with another question. Ah, there's also Oleg. Okay, I will start with uh, one question with Alexander, then move to a question by Noah, then a question by Jakob, then a question by Toye. So, uh, Alexander, your question is. Do we need to calculate PIN for protection or only well-being and living standards? Alexander, we, wa we want to calculate a PIN for protection in our sector that will be the same one uh, utilized for protection consequence. We don't want two separate PINs uh, in the document. So we want the protection cluster, including the AORs, to calculate a protection PIN uh, in consultation with OCHA and other sectors, and we would like that pin to be adopted at the protection as the protection consequence pin. What we do not want is to have two different protection pins, one for consequence in the uh, document 
and one different in the in the sector. So I hope that this is uh, that this is clear. Uh, please follow up in writing uh, if that's not the case, and if OCHA is pushing otherwise in the country operation, we're happy to weigh in and correct that. Uh, Noah, thank you so much for your question. Uh, please share a couple of traditionally non-protection indicators that can be used uh, for uh, general protection. Uh, Noah, uh, for your question, I think general protection uh, uh, issues, for example, could be related to a situation of malnutrition in a geographic location. That's not a, a, a standard protection indicator, but if malnutrition is very high in a specific uh, geographic location, this is a proxy indicator that the general protection situation is bad and could be used as such. I hope this uh, this makes sense, Noah. Uh, please uh, follow up in case uh, uh, I didn't answer. Now, Jacob, uh, thanks for your question. I will read it uh, out loud. This is a question specific to the mine action sector. How do you suggest calculation of PIN in cases of contamination in public spaces? For example, a town with 60,000 uh, residents and contamination in public areas in the center of town, how would you calculate uh, the PIN? Uh, we, Jacob, you continue saying, we previously had the experience that mine action PIN was higher than all other sectors combined. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Jakob. Uh, uh, I will ask uh, Christelle to add uh, to, I would say, my initial sense is that the protection risk on people uh, living uh, in areas where the public spaces are contaminated makes them at risk of protection issues, and hence they are in need of protection. So they are people in need of protection. Now, this is where you have to go contextual and try to understand uh, the frequency of how many people frequently fre uh, access these areas, how close these areas are to residential areas and how frequently they are used. That would allow you to disaggregate this uh, big number that rightly so would be big uh, to something that is more explainable at a narrative level and shows you, uh, you know, how, uh, how many people are in high risk area versus low risk area if the context allows. So my principal answer before handing over to Christelle is, these are people in need of protection. They are at risk of protection issues and they have to be accounted for. If the number is too high, that's a reality. We, our job is not to reduce the numbers, it's to reflect the reality. Now, if a more eloquent or sophisticated analysis of this spin uh, is possible, for example, to disaggregate uh, how many are in immediate risk, how many are in uh, more circumstantial risk, that would be useful for the analysis and useful for programming later on. I hand over to Christelle. William, that was a perfect answer. You, you should be the MAAOR coordinator <laughs> because there's not much more I can add. But just to say to Jacob and colleagues, uh, I think one of the challenge for us is, is the fact that we have, you know, explosive ordnance that are in some places. And then we have people who are moving around. And of course, we don't, we cannot predict where people will move, where they will go. Uh, we know, for instance, if you look at the Nigeria situation, we know that many people are in IDP, they cannot get out of them. So, well, they're protected. But we know that we also want to have, you know, freedom of movement and to be able to return to their villages. And this information and prediction is probably with someone else. Maybe it's a displacement tracking exercise that IOM does or UNHCR or other clusters that are looking at the displacement uh, trends and patterns. And we need to work with them to understand, okay, 
you know, what is the likelihood of people coming and crossing to this minefield? Or what is the likelihood of those 60,000 people going, going to those public areas that are contaminated in the town of Libya? Libya? So I don't have a perfect answer for you. Um, and just to add, when we met with Ocha and looked at a key factor for us, which is, you know, how far do you live from a contaminated area? Do you remember I asked this question to Ocha, you know, what most of our colleagues say, well, you at risk and you should be in the pin if you are within one kilometer of a contaminated area. But others said, no, it could be if you are, you know, Ocha responded 10 kilometer away, because if you're going to walk those 10 kilometers to access markets or livelihood or your fields or the hospital, or the school, you know, it's not just one kilometer that counts. So you got to look at what are the patterns of movement and how people, where do pe people travel in order to go to, to access uh, basic services. So that's uh, uh, my answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, so much. So I have questions from Toya, Keith, Murga, Coco, Pauline, and Sasha. Uh, unless you have Additional burning questions. I encourage everyone to stop asking questions. So I think uh, we uh, able to answer these uh, six people. If you have further questions, please liaise with us bilaterally and your focal points in the teams uh, after uh, after the webinar. So uh, to I hope uh, I am pronouncing the name. The question is. Is coping mechanism also considered as a pillar for indicators? Thank you for this question. We've been <laughs> struggling with uh, with the concept there because we had different guidances uh, with OCHA that gives different answers. The simple answer is the following. The minimum pillars are physical, mental well-being, living standards, and protection. We would like to see that protection as a main pillar. Now, if the if in a country you have the capacity the data and the kind of conceptual frame to have coping uh, mechanisms as well as resilience which is another one uh, uh, so you have the data to calculate people in need of uh, uh, under these pillars this is more than welcome i think the direction for next year is to go in this direction uh, for this year, I think we're sticking to the minimum, which is physical, mental well-being and living standards. If in your operation you can go to coping mechanism, please do so. Uh, we encourage you and we're happy to support you uh, on that. Keith. Keith, you say that you're not sure you understand the calculation of the PIN. We understood that only indicators related to living standard plus survival, not those related to protection consequences and resilience. Right. So maybe let me uh, re, uh, rephrase. In the HNO, we will have one figure of people in need of physical and mental well being with another additional uh, or a bigger pin of people in need of standard. Uh, uh, and living uh, related issues. A third pin that we would like you to calculate for sure in every operation is people in need of protection. The people in need of protection, part of them will be people in need of uh, physical and mental well being, part of them will be in need of living standards related issues, and there could be additional issues. Uh, that are not covered in uh, in these two uh, in the protection pin. In addition to the protection pin, we will have a, 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 a an operational pin, the bigger operational number. It might be the case that some operation, the protection pin and the general pin would be the same. Even if it is the same, we would like to push for in the narrative and the description to make sure that we use the terms people in need of protection. We would don't want in the overall description of the crisis for it not to have the protection component uh, in it. So if there is a push from the interagency level on this, we are happy to support uh, and 
uh, make sure we're all on the same line, Keith. Kristen, uh, thank you. Uh, PC Somalia, I think that's in uh, response to the question of what could be a general indicator that is not a traditional protection one. We have Somalia also suggesting food insecurity. That's also a proxy indicator for protection related issues. Now, MEGA, uh, considering in an AOR, I think when there is not a common data of the PIN for all sectors, OCHA should encourage every sector to focus on the same data. What do you think about it? Uh, Murga, can you take the mic and explain your question? I don't uh, get it. Murga, can you try to take the mic and uh, rephrase your question? Going once, going twice, we'll follow up with you bilaterally. Coco, we move to Coco. I want to know what is the difference between the severity pin calculation of this from last year, because for us, it seems the same. Coco, which operation are you in? Coco. Uh, Coco, we can hear you. Hi, we are from Niger. Niger, very good. Yes. Uh, thanks, Coco. Uh, if the methodology is the same, uh, as a minimum, that's fine for us. That's no problem. We're not trying to make a reform for reform's sake. So if your methodology is agreed upon and is the same, please go ahead with it. What I need you to focus on is to make sure that the protection pin and the protection narrative is featured centrally in the HNO and not only limited to the protection sector. Uh, and the second thing, as I repeated, that the protection sector pin is the same uh, figure that is used at the intersectoral level uh, for protection issues. That's it. If you have these two elements in place, uh, please go ahead and repeat last year's methodology. No problem. Uh, Pauline, isn't there a risk of duplication if you, we use such a wide range of indicator for calculating PIN? Thanks, Pauline. This is an important question. Uh, I think in some uh, uh, operations and some geographic locations where we don't have solid protection data, we have to revert to proxy indicators. And in such situations, uh, uh, indicators like food insecurity and malnutrition could be useful uh, as a proxy for protection. Now, even if the environment is rich in data related to protection, these indicators can still be used, but they're not the only protection indicator. They're one of a composite set of indicators for severity uh, for protection. Uh, what this, the use of such indicator would help us is to increase the collaboration with other clusters uh, and have more an integrated approach for analysis that, that is important. Now I move to the final question. Uh, Sasha, can you kindly share minutes following this meeting? Internet is quite bad and the line keeps cutting. Uh, thank you, Sh Sasha. We, uh, I will share my talking points uh, after the meeting, no problem. Uh, the webinar is actually recorded and can be, you can re-listen to it uh, when, uh, when internet connection is better. If uh, neither works for you, uh, we're still happy to have a bilateral conversation with you uh, to address uh, to address your issues. The link for the video will be shared uh, um, after the. It will need some time until it's uploaded, and then we will share it with you all. Yeah. Thank you, Mulham. Okay, thank you all uh, for your questions.
uh, that was quite interactive, uh, more than what we have imagined. So uh, it shows how uh, topical the issue is. Uh, I would like again to thank uh, uh, the global team uh, uh, that is here uh, around us that is contributing uh, to this. And big thanks to the IMOs from the AORs and the Global Protection Cluster that are going on mission or are currently on mission. Uh, on behalf of uh, all of us, uh, this work is important uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, a quite crucial in a year that is very uh, transitional in nature and the guidance is uh, uh, fluffy uh, in some parts of it that we, we keep the dialogue open. This is the only way we can have, uh, we can remain on the right track and not, uh, not have any major issues that have, uh, can have repercussions for next year's. So thanks a lot, uh, everyone, uh, for the good work. Thank you for your hard work and keep in touch bilaterally. Uh, if need be, we are on standby to support you. Have a good evening.